When we were young, we were told that a second was 1 60th of a minute, and there are 3,600 of them in an hour. This information is so deeply rooted in our day-to-day -day activities that we rarely question it. How do we know how much a second really lasts? Each unit of measurement we use to tell time, like days, hours, and minutes, is connected to how the Earth spins around in space. People in ancient times looked up to the sky and noticed that our planet takes a certain amount of time to do stuff. That was their way to track time, and for the most part, things haven't changed. However, our calendars have gotten a bit more precise these days. You see, our world's a lot more technological now. With computers working extremely fast, being able to do billions of things in a second, we can't rely solely on Earth's movement to measure time. That's because our planet's patterns change a tiny bit over time. Imagine if today's second was slightly longer than yesterday's. It would mess up calendars all over the world and cause trouble for all sorts of devices. So, in the 1950s, scientists thought of a precise way to measure a second. Instead of looking up at the stars, they zoomed in on some of the smallest things available, atoms. They found that certain materials, especially one called cesium, move in a very predictable way. Today, we know how much a second lasts based on the movements of cesium atoms. This way of counting seconds has some ancient ties, though. It's connected to how an astronomer named Simon Newcomb watched the Earth move way back in the 19th century. He tried to understand the exact movement of planets and why they sometimes stray from their regular path. He also studied the moon and its phases and figured out the previous lunar calculations were wrong. When scientists switched to their atomic stopwatch in 1967, they made sure it was in line with his observations. We know that our planet makes a complete rotation on its axis in 24 hours. That's not exactly true. It does it in 23 hours and 56 minutes. We also know that for Earth to rotate around the sun, it needs 365 days. That's not entirely accurate either. In fact, it needs an extra five hours to finish the task. That's why every four years, we add an additional day to our calendars during the month of February. By using cesium to measure the exact duration of a second, we make sure we're always consistent. This type of metal is used today in most atomic clocks. You'll find them everywhere. They're in the gadgets that need GPS in our cars and phones, in those huge networks that let us call or text each other, and of course, in science labs doing all sorts of research. And here's how the atomic clocks using cesium actually work. Each device has this special chamber. Scientists call it the microwave cavity, but they don't use it to reheat leftovers. It's also full of cesium fog. When they pump microwaves into this chamber, it's like turning on their favorite playlist for cesium atoms. They start moving around and they emit radiation in a special way and for a specific amount of time. This tune then gets caught by a sort of atomic ear or a detector if you want to keep it technical. It's matched with a known beat to see if they're in sync. If there's any difference between these beats, the clock tweaks itself, the same way singers adjust the pitch of a song to match another. Not all atomic clocks use cesium, though. Some use other metals, too, like rubidium and strontium. Some even use hydrogen. But the principle is the same. They monitor atoms to tell time. Regardless of the materials they use, atomic clocks are certainly more precise, but they aren't 100% accurate either. In fact, even one of the most accurate atomic clocks in the world, located in Boulder, Colorado, can have errors. However, current estimations say it can have an error of about one second in 100 million years of measuring time. Way better than looking at the sky to tell time. Either way, this celestial time-telling is part of our history. Thousands of years ago, our ancestors began using the moon to track time. They drew little pictures of its phases on the walls of their caves and on smaller objects too, like bone fragments. 
This shows us that people had this need to plan their activities even when they didn't have a watch on their wrists all throughout the day. Fast forward to about 5,000 years ago in Egypt. Locals there saw that a star named Sirius rose at the same time the Nile River flooded. This flood was very important because it helped them grow food. So, people came up with sundials, these big outdoor clocks that could tell time using shadows. They even broke the day into 12-hour chunks, very similar to the system we use today. The Egyptians even made the first water clocks, using the dripping liquid from a tank to show the passing hours. Inspired by this, people in Asia came up with a better way to tell time. They used mercury instead of water because it wouldn't freeze. The hourglass, that beautiful timer with sand inside, came around only about a thousand years ago. Just like the water clock, it used gravity to measure time. Another fun invention was the candle clock. Imagine telling time by seeing how fast a candle melts. In the 14th century, Europe built its first mechanical clock, a big step toward modern watches. These early gadgets weren't all that accurate, but they kept improving. By the 16th century, thanks to a swinging pendulum, clocks got a lot better at telling us a bit more precisely what time it was. As timekeeping kept evolving, things didn't necessarily go smoothly. At one point, scientists tried to create a universal standard for time. They used a swinging pendulum, but it didn't work the same everywhere on Earth due to gravity. That's because this force can differ depending on where you are on our planet. It also affects everything with a mass, so it obviously messes up pendulums too. We also needed to tell time accurately while at sea. The British, for instance, wanted a durable and precise clock for sea travel. Enter John Harrison, who spent over 30 years perfecting a clock that could withstand the challenges of sea voyages. It's called the marine chronometer, and it helped with better calculating one's position at sea. This was an important step in the field of navigation, but it still relied on watching celestial bodies. Regardless, thanks to inventors like Harrison, timekeeping kept getting better and smaller. What started as huge metal devices eventually became pocket-sized. These days, we have ways to tell the time everywhere, like on our TV sets, watches, phones, and in our cars. But you can always go back to the basics if you've run out of battery, and for some reason, there's no one around to tell you the time. You'll need to be outside, though. Begin by positioning your body towards the sun. Stretch one of your arms in front and make sure your palm is facing you. Then rotate your hand so your fingers are parallel to the horizon. Make sure the fingers are closed together and move your hand either up or down so that your pinky is aligned with the horizon. Start counting how many fingers you'll need to reach the sun. You may need to stack fingers from both hands on top of each other until you get there. This all depends on the time of day and possibly even the season you find yourself in. If your fingers are average in thickness, then four of them are the equivalent of one hour of sunlight. It won't be as precise as an atomic clock, but it does show how resourceful we can be by just looking at the sun, using our hands and adding just a dash of simple mathematics. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.